June 25th. Now, uh, over 100 days since the COVID-19 pandemic reached the communities that we serve at HHS. Um, today's town hall addresses that subject as well as others. Uh, some very big news in terms of our transformation agenda and other things that are going on across the organization. Uh, my name is Aaron Levo. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs. I'll be moderating uh, today's town hall along with uh, several colleagues who will be providing updates and information. Um, we're going to have a, a question session. Um, we'll pause a, at a couple of points for questions along the way. Uh, we have some that were asked ahead of time, so thank you very much for submitting those. And then we'll also have um, a nice a meaty question session at the end followed by some celebrations. Uh, just a reminder in terms of how to ask questions, uh, if you'd like to uh, ask them live, you can raise your hand uh, in the participants forum and we'll call on you in order. Uh, in addition, you can also use the Q&A and chat function. Um, people have in the past emailed and texted me as well, which is probably the least likely way to get your question up because I'm not looking at those particular uh, outlets, but uh, the other three are um, bang on. So why don't we start uh, with an update from our president and CEO. CEO, Rob McIsaac. Um, Rob, uh, what's your update today? Where are we at this week? Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for the introduction, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks, uh, as always, for tuning into uh, today's town hall. So we'll have a few short uh, presentations from some of our leaders, uh, and as Aaron mentioned, uh, hopefully we'll have time uh, uh, to get into a, you know, a significant back and forth in terms of questions. Just a reminder, <clears throat> if we don't get to your question today, um, send it to hhsnews at hhsc.ca. Um, we'll post a response uh, on the hub. So we just had our annual general meeting with our board, um, and it's a kind of nice time uh, to reflect a bit on some of the accomplishments of the last year. I know COVID-19 is top of mind, uh, and um, I'm really proud of the organization's achievements in managing the pandemic, um, and they're considerable. But you know, we also achieved so much more over the past year, uh, and we started on some very important projects aimed at transforming uh, the way we operate at HHS. Um, some of that work has continued. Uh, the balance is uh, beginning to resume. Um, and uh, from my perspective, you know, uh, maintaining that work on transformation uh, is it continues to be integral to our organization's success and sustainability moving forward. But it's probably, I think it's worthwhile just to reflect, reflect briefly on some of the highlights we saw in the last year. You know, we celebrated um, and an immensely generous $100 million endowment uh, from Charles and Margaret Jurovinsky for health research here in Hamilton. Really wonderful news. We expanded our stem cell um, unit uh, at the Jurovinsky, which will allow us to um, provide really um, cutting edge treatment, uh, almost uh, you know, uh, unique in Canada. We achieved exemplary standing after our Accreditation Canada uh, review, uh, which was an enormous effort uh, and a, a great uh, outcome. We took uh, a big step forward to uh, rebuilding um, West Lincoln Memorial Hospital. Uh, we installed a hybrid uh, OR after a great fundraising campaign. We, we got our Ontario Health Team uh, approval uh, and uh, started that important work with our community. We were ranked third uh, in Canada as a research hospital. Um, our NICU expanded to be the largest in Canada. Um, we kicked off our managed equipment services partnership with Siemens, guaranteeing that our diagnostic will be uh, evergreen uh, going forward. And as I mentioned off the top, you know, just wonderful uh, work done in response to and in preparation for a potential wave of COVID patients. So um, thank you, everybody, for uh, all of the uh, work in, in uh, doing those things, which, from my perspective, are really significant. 
Uh, those and many more milestones are included in our latest annual report. Uh, if you're interested, I would commend you to um, uh, our website uh, to uh, take a look at that. I'm also happy to share some good news on our transformation journey. We took another uh, bold step. As many of you have likely read, we're moving forward with procuring a new hospital information uh, system. This is a really big milestone for us as an organization. It's the largest investment in IT our, our organization has ever made. Probably uh, one of the most important clinical projects in the history of Hamilton Health Sciences. This process has been about a year in the making, which included a six month uh, cons consultative phase where uh, many of you provided valuable input. We are now entering negotiations with Epic, which as many of you know, is a leading provider of this technology. Um, really want to thank uh, and shout out, give a, a, a good shout out to the individuals who've been part of the H HIS project team uh, for getting us to this phase, and in particular, Barry Lum, uh, Rob Lloyd, Dwayne Bender, Michelle Leeflor, uh, all of whom have uh, made significant contributions to getting us uh, to this important stage. Uh, and of course, to all of you who participated in many engagement sessions and focus groups, your contributions to the project um, uh, have been and will be uh, key to its success. So uh, we, we are going to continue to rely on you for input. Um, as you'll recall, our plan for the reintegration of services was uh, approved by Ontario Health uh, in May. We're continuing to collaborate with our regional hospital partners to reintroduce services. Um, I think we're going to need to remain nimble during the pandemic in the event that we start to see an uptick in the number of cases. At HHS, we're moving ahead with the next phase of increasing surgical and procedural activity across all our sites this week. So in this next phase, we'll see an additional 20% of surgical and procedural uh, services return. This work is happening in uh, closely in concert with the Ambulatory Task Force. As services resume, there will be additional demand on our sites for post-surgical and procedural care. So uh, Wes Stephen will provide some additional details around this uh, on this call. On the pandemic pay front, um, understandably uh, an important issue, we are working to prepare uh, to make payment to eligible individuals. Um, it's it's a quite a complex thing to sort through. Those of you not eligible for this pay totally understand your frustration. Everyone at HHS has risen to the challenge uh, brought by COVID-19. And I just want you to know, I, I speak on behalf of the entire leadership team and saying that your hard work, the sacrifices and dedication are recognized and appreciated. Um, we are continuing to ask the province to expand pandemic pay to all those who contributed so much in very difficult service uh, circumstances. Um, for those of you who are eligible, we have not yet received any cash from uh, the provincial government. Uh, and as I said earlier, we're, we're getting ready to process payment once we receive funding. We'll continue to fight for everyone working with our partners uh, in this advocacy effort. And Dave McKig is going to just run through um, where we're at uh, not briefly. Finally, uh, this week is Star Week, which stands for Special Thanks and Recognition. It's um, a time to celebrate the incredible team we have here at HHS. Once again, I, I want to say thank you for going above and beyond, uh, not only during the pandemic, but every day um, here at HHS. We recognize the significant challenges of working in healthcare over the past few months. Um, and even in the midst of such challenges, it's been incredible to see uh, people's passion and dedication. So we're grateful and proud of all of our physicians, staff members uh, across the whole hospital. Uh, thank you for being part of the HHS team. 
Um, looking forward to hearing some more celebrations uh, at the end of today's town hall and, and throughout the week. Uh, for now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barry Lum, uh, who's doing a really great job uh, in leading um, us to a new HIS uh, at Hamilton Health Sciences. So Barry, over to you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I just want to uh, re-emphasize uh, the landmark uh, nature of our decision to, to begin negotiations with uh, EPIC, which uh, really represents the, uh, the gold standard in academic health information systems, uh, really worldwide, but also increasingly in Ontario. Um, they are uh, by far the most sophisticated HIS that, that we would have the opportunity to be involved with. Um, I'd also like to uh, officially uh, mention to you, those of you who are not yet aware that we have a new uh, Chief Information Officer at uh, HHS. Uh, Michelle Lefleur has joined us from uh, Ottawa where uh, she has gained a really very deep experience uh, with their EPIC implementation, led them through that uh, with their Go Live a year ago and is bringing all of that knowledge and skill uh, to HHS. So we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, Michelle with us. Uh, the HIS is really meant to be a clinical project taking advantage of our uh, IT infrastructure, but I, we really want to emphasize over and over again uh, that this is a clinical project that's going to result uh, in improved patient care across HHS. Every aspect of care uh, will be affected by uh, the HIS and the patient's journey across HHS and in our other uh, partners will be enhanced. Uh, there will be a single source of truth and a consistent message uh, and information about the patient's journey wherever they land within our institution. Um, an HIS will not succeed uh, without the deep involvement of every one of us uh, and uh, in that project. And it's extremely important that you uh, begin to think about this journey as starting today uh, with a uh, implementation uh, coming two years from now. But our success will be based uh, entirely on the contribution of all of our staff uh, to get us ready to, to the go live. What you're seeing here is a, uh, a very rough uh, timeline of uh, where we will be going. Uh, as we have indicated on Friday, we hope to uh, have a successful negotiation with EPIC uh, beginning literally next week, and we hope that we can have a contract in place uh, in the late summer and for final uh, board approval uh, in the very early part of the fall. However, that uh, work uh, on the negotiation doesn't mean that we can't also begin work on preparing for the implementation phase, and you will be hearing about uh, that as we go along over the next uh, few months. The formal implementation will likely begin in the late fall uh, with training of what are called super users and uh, individuals who will be seconded to the project for the duration of the project and potentially beyond, and you'll be hearing more about that. We hope to go live June of uh, 2022, uh, and that will uh, then move us to what we call an optimi optimization phase uh, that will really last uh, forever, but will uh, be particularly important in the first uh, six months or so. So what does it mean for you? It means that uh, you have the opportunity to help shape the way our HIS will be implemented. It gives you the opportunity to get engaged and uh, to feel that if there are if this is something that's really important to you, there will be opportunities for you to become even more deeply involved. It will put us in a position where we have data and real-time information about our patients uh, at our fingertips every uh, step of the way. Uh, we will be moving to a fully digital workplace uh, and that paper chart that you see currently on the wards and, and, and in the clinics uh, will disappear as we uh, really move into this next phase. Thanks, Rob. 
So maybe we could stop there and take a few questions. I know that's a lot, and this is, as uh, Rob and Barry have both highlighted, it's such a critical and monumental undertaking for the organization. Um, I can st if we could pause and maybe take some questions specifically on this topic. I know, Barry, I can see one already here in our Q&A section asking, will EPIC be extended to lab medicine, uh, recognizing that every patient that comes to the hospital gets a lab test, um, it's critical that the, the labs and clinical teams are, are communicating on the same interface. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Lab is, a, is, is uh, of course, uh, critical. Uh, and we have the HRLMP, the Hamilton Regional Lab Medicine Program, which is uh, currently uh, shared with St. Joe's. That uh, All of that information will be deeply integrated into uh, our HIS and also uh, into the HIS at St. Joe's is also an epic-based uh, system. I also have a question here. So I have um, Anna Maria Tancredi with her hand up in the um, participants list. So uh, Anna Maria, if you can hear me, go ahead with your question for Barry. Hi there. Um, I was just actually going to type it as well, but I'll thank you for, for responding to my hand. Um, I'm just wondering if the clinics that are currently using uh, PatientLink, which is an Epic product, um, you know, that we started using about four or five years ago, is that going to be replaced as well? Or is this sort of dovetailing into some of the work that's already been started in some of the uh, ambulatory care clinics? No, you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, the current uh, patient link system, uh, which is used uh, uh, in Boris and in the, uh, the Children's Hospital, will be upgraded and brought into uh, the new uh, HIS. And Barry, can you talk about the integration with St. Joe's? The, St. Joe's Hamilton is on the EPIC platform. Uh, what will that look like for us? Thanks, Aaron. So this is really important, and I know a, a big issue for, for many of us. Uh, and um, the, the nature of HIS systems and EPIC in particular is that they absolutely need to be able to be integrated and communicate with other institutions. Uh, the EPIC uh, system has a, a whole series of, uh, of modules and systems that allow that to happen. EPIC likes to use kind of catchy terms, so they call it happy together. Uh, and it really involves uh, deep integration in what is seamless to the user uh, between the two institutions and other institutions in the EPIC platform where all of what's happening to their uh, journey at St. Joe's will be evident and, and usable by HHS and vice versa. Perfect, well, why don't we keep moving then? We'll have another opportunity for a Q&A at the end. I do like that though, I wanna comment on happy together. That describes our relationship with our partners in so many ways and it will in this instance too, that's good stuff. So thanks, Barry. Um, let's keep moving. I think we have um, uh, Dr. Stephen, you're next. So Wes Stephen, our Chief Operating Officer to give an update on some of our service resumption activities. Uh, thanks very much, Aaron. Um, so uh, just to recap where we were, on May 28th, we started to uh, start reintegrating some of the clinical services that, that were placed on pause. Um, at that point in time, we, uh, uh, in the periop program and interventions, uh, we increased by approximately 20% of that resource to allow more patients to get their care. Um, um, when we use procedural work, we're referring to places like the cardiac catheterization, the arrhythmia lab, uh, skin lesions and the lumps and bumps clinics uh, as examples on top of the perioperative program. Uh, today, uh, happy to announce uh, that we are actually going into the next phase of a ramp up which is an additional 20% of operating time across the enterprise at each of the uh, sites. Um, and uh, net new, since May 28th, we believe this will be uh, 218 surgical cases and 223 uh, additional procedures on a weekly basis. Um, clearly, there are some um, restrictions uh, that are coming provincially as a directive that we need to maintain a 10% surge capacity for burden of disease that may occur in our community for COVID-19 patients. And of course, we also have to monitor on a weekly basis uh, the, uh, the impact of these uh, integrations or ramp ups uh, with respect to bed capacity, uh, resources such as PPE, uh, the foot traffic within the organization, uh, the screening at our doors, 
um, and uh, evaluating the daily health status of patients who are waiting for their care. Um, I, I do uh, just want to acknowledge a big shout out, particularly in the perioperative program, where we have traditionally had standard work where we would have shutdowns this summer across the enterprise. The, the teams, uh, whether it's uh, nursing or support services, anesthesia and surgeons, have been rescheduling their vacation time. So to uh, not have formal shutdowns that we have typically done to actually enhance this uh, reintegration of clinical services. So I'd like to thank those teams in particular for rescheduling some of their off time. Um, Another major piece of work that is occurring is really a planning around ambulatory services. As the enterprise knows, uh, we did consolidate into a much smaller footprint uh, and uh, pivoted in a very large way to virtual care. We are currently seeing on-site visits for must-do patients. Uh, the task force is actively uh, looking and planning at the next ramp up or phase in approach uh, with expanding more ambulatory services. Uh, as previously noted, we need to assess those impacts of, of foot traffic and as well, we, we need to stay nimble, uh, not knowing what uh, the COVID burden of disease will be in the community. So stay tuned on ambulatory. Uh, there is active work going on about expanding that uh, uh, services. We continue to strongly leverage virtual care and continue to uh, look for opportunities to expand that. So I, with that, I think I'll turn over to you, Aaron, to introduce the next speaker. Sure, thanks a lot, uh, Wes. Uh, so next up is uh, Dave McKegg. Uh, our uh, EVP of clinical bear, or sorry, of corporate affairs, to talk a little bit uh, about pandemic pay. I know Rob touched on this, but Dave, maybe you want to broaden the topic because uh, I know a lot of people are interested. Hey, thanks, Aaron. Um, so I will uh, reiterate some of what Rob said. So it is a very complicated endeavor. Um, we uh, continue to ask the province, first of all, to expand pandemic pay for all that have contributed. And I just want to emphasize that. I know you've heard that message many, many times from, from senior leadership here, but it is uh, so appreciated the work that has been done and we would like to see everybody recognized. Uh, we do continue to work with our regional and provincial partners to continue to advocate in a very uh, public way around this issue. Um, also, from a process standpoint, we're now working with the H&HB Lynn to follow process that we need to in order to get to the stage where we're able to pay out the pandemic pay. And uh, once we get to that point and receive funds, we'll be able to disperse them to all that are eligible under current regulations. Um, I know a question has been asked, trying to keep an eye on the questions around how will we know if we're eligible. Uh, right now, uh, the ministry uh, does, or the government does have a, a website which lists uh, titles of categories that are included, but to uh, get to the point where we know for Hamilton Health Sciences what that means, we're reviewing hundreds of job codes and making sure that we can have the appropriate uh, answers. And once we have those, then we'll be able to communicate it. Uh, I think there's another question, and uh, the question, whoever asked it was correct, on a previous uh, webinar we were asked if uh, pandemic pay would apply to those who are working remotely, working at home during this pandemic, and the answer that I gave was yes. Uh, not sooner, just within a couple of days after that, the government uh, changed or, or stipulated that that would not be uh, eligible. So those that have uh, been uh, working uh, hard on behalf of our patients but remotely will not be eligible for pandemic pay as it stands. So uh, keep, uh, you know, um, keep your fingers crossed. We'll keep you up to date as we learn more uh, as we go through this, uh, this entire process. Um, you know, I wish we had uh, clearer answers and faster solutions, but uh, we're working through it as best we can. And I'd like to actually give a shout out to um, the, uh, the HR and payroll teams who have worked uh, quite a bit in advance of all of this. So as soon as we can, we'll be able and ready to uh, issue payment. I'll turn it back, Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Dave, and thanks for taking on those questions. Maybe I could just um, also add, and Rob, you could um, uh, maybe add color to this too. I know uh, that across the region, hospital CEOs have been working together in collaboration to advocate to government. I know that we, uh, HHS specifically, has met with uh, MPPs uh, in the government uh, to brief them on this subject, to talk about uh, the exclusions and the problems uh, that are associated with excluding categories of jobs. Um, you know, this is in, in, in uh, collaboration, too, with the Ontario Hospital Association's efforts to also 
on uh, bringing attention to this matter. So no shortage of advocacy around this topic out there, uh, trying to close the gaps that exist. Yeah, I think that's that's fair, Aaron. You know, as part of this um, whole pandemic response effort, um, I've been chairing the um, CEO's committee for um, HNHB, uh, the former HNHB hospitals, and so we've definitely uh, been raising this issue uh, with those CEOs who are very like-minded, and uh, so. Um, you know, the, the open letter uh, that was uh, put out uh, some time ago, we intend to uh, follow that up with further um, communication uh, to the public and to the government uh, on this issue in the relatively near future. So I think there's good alignment across hospitals and CEOs, and so we'll, we'll continue to do what we can. But uh, the government, um, I mean, just being forthright, uh, the government seems pretty steadfast at the moment, but we'll, we'll continue pushing. Excellent. Uh, Wes, just a question in here about the service redeployment that you were touching on, uh, specifically asking, do we know how this will affect the clerk staff? Uh, and if so, will there be redeployment opportunities or layoffs? Maybe Dave, you could also jump in on that one. Um, any update on how, as we ramp up, it'll affect other staff and continue to impact redeployment, et cetera? So maybe I'll start and then turn over to Dave. Um, the uh, workforce management um, is increasingly complex uh, for the organization. So um, if we go back a few months when uh, we ramped down, we created a, a task force of redeployment um, and uh, that's where we were. Subsequent to that, uh, we have had issues such as supporting long-term care. Uh, we're reintegrating our services. Um, we, um, we have been having conversations with the government about alternate health facilities, which we will be, if successfully funded, we would require staffing for. And so uh, I can't specifically comment about business clerks, but I will say that, uh, that uh, I know our HR uh, group is working very hard at not just redeployment, but looking at all the supply and demands um, uh, of, of all the needs of the organization that extends not just within our walls, but uh, uh, outside of our walls um, as well. So um, I, I just will acknowledge uh, Kirsten and Carl's group, uh, HR's group, that are actively trying to put together a, a more comprehensive plan and that it will facilitate and help us uh, make those uh, decisions um, about where our staff are going to be working. So maybe I'll turn over to Dave to add any more color to that. Uh, thanks, Wes. Uh, just a little bit, I guess. So uh, one of the words in the question was layoff. Uh, we don't see layoffs coming from any work. And in fact, uh, the government was very clear that there will be no layoffs due to COVID. So I, I just put your mind at rest with respect to that. Um, the uh, redeployment of staff uh, is something that does continue to be necessary. And, uh, as, and Wes has already outlined a lot of the, uh, the work that's been done there. Um, workforce planning more broadly than redeployment uh, comes into play as we're trying to figure out how to address all of the demands coming at us as an organization to serve our, our community, including ramp up of scheduled care. Uh, so um, uh, Human Resources with uh, Michelle LaRue and uh, co-chaired with uh, Bruce Squires uh, from uh, Muncie have been working very hard to make sure that those processes are surfacing these questions in a way that we can start to address them. And it really is now moving into, as Wes already said, uh, a supply and demand exercise of what supply do we have of staff, what kind of roles do we need, uh, and uh, what potential hiring will we need to do as we move forward. That said, it's still a bit nebulous as we work with our um, our government and our land to understand how much investment is coming to address all of the patient demands that we see. So lots more to come on all of that. So I'm seeing there's, I want to be respectful of those that submitted questions ahead of time. I do have a few uh, to ask. Um, thank you very much for doing that. And I want to also acknowledge, I see uh, several in our Q&A forum uh, around EPIC in particular and the new HIS system, as well as some others about uh, issues about, again, the workforce during the pandemic. So we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, but if I could, I'd like to uh, ask some of the questions that were sent ahead of time. Uh, the first, um, I think maybe Kirsten, we could get your uh, update on this. There's around the visitation 
uh, changes, which I know are a big deal uh, for our organization. We made some sweeping changes that have impacted our patients, and the caregivers, and family members that support them. Um, any first question is any updates on allowing visitation to resume for palliative care patients, or long, uh, more specifically, even also all of the long-term care patients that are now uh, in Hamilton Health Sciences beds. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, so we did uh, enter our, I'll say, a, a kind of a first phase of relaxing our visiting policy, and this is great news for our patients and families as well. Uh, we know their wellness has very much uh, been impacted by these uh, several. Uh, several weeks of restraint um, around visitation. So the policy that's been released and was communicated yesterday as we move into this next phase applies to all of our campuses, um, regardless of kind of who you are as a patient. In other words, the inpatient guidelines. So if you are uh, a patient admitted into a palliative care unit or happen to be a patient awaiting uh, transfer to long-term care, or perhaps even some of the patients that we had that uh, came in from long-term care to us uh, for care, um, the same rules would apply to them as far as an inpatient visitor. Um, so again, um, people can have one person at the bedside, you know, on a daily basis, uh, teens would identify two family members or caregivers that are important in their lives to be allowed to visit, um, and you can have that individual at the bedside. There are still exceptions uh, possible that would be authorized by the clinical manager. Um, so in the case of a palliative care unit, as an example, somebody who's got um, um, a very short life expectancy still, you know, two to three, four weeks, uh, perhaps before end of life, um, certainly there can be some flex on the part of the manager, whether or not they allow uh, more people at the bedside or allow them to be outside of the window of visiting hours. Uh, that we've now put back in place, which are nine o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the evening. So there are exceptions that are always possible uh, on the part of team discussion and the manager um, making that authorization. But generally speaking, everybody now uh, in inpatient areas are entitled to visits. Again, a very specific uh, COVID, uh, COVID patient positive uh, nuance in that that allows just the one caregiver. Um, but again, we wanted some uh, visitor there or family member to be able to go to the bedside. Of course, they would have PPE on and the same would apply to anybody else who's in any sort of uh, infection control precautions. I guess on the flip side, there's a, a, another question asking if it would be possible to maintain uh, some hours around visitation uh, going forward, recognizing that uh, it is a challenge managing a uh, guests in the hospital during the pandemic and at the best of times. I know we actually went to a 24-7 uh, visiting policy uh, but a few years back. Um, is it our plan to return to that? And if so, why would we do that? Yeah, so certainly that has been best practice uh, in many parts of our world. Um, and, you know, certainly we uh, look to the Barrel Institute, who is a, a global leader when it comes to uh, patient and family experience, um, and look to, you know, what is happening in the field at large. So 24-7 visiting. Um, has been uh, very much the norm for hospitals uh, for quite some period of time now. Um, however, I understand the question as well. Um, you know, I think there has been some, you know, debate on and off um, since we've gone to 24-7 a few years ago. Um, you know, I think it's, it's worthwhile, event, again, for us to have a look at that. Um, but for now, certainly the visiting hours are important for us. Uh, to, to really manage what is happening on our premises. So wait and see, um, but I think it's a good question to raise now around, you know, is there anything down the road that we want to do differently? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to get to a few of the questions about EPIC in our, uh, in our chat uh, forum. I did see my friend Lori Isenman with her hand up. And Lori, uh, we can get to you in a couple of minutes, but I want to, uh, maybe Barry, I could ask you a couple of the things there uh, that have been asked. There's a series of questions. I guess first off, you know, uh, the implementation of EPIC alongside Joe's is great, but what about uh, family health uh, and uh, long-term care and other places? How will we be able to integrate with them and does it make sense to harmonize systems there too? Yeah, thanks, uh, Aaron. Uh, a couple of points. Um, there are, just as I, I described uh, Happy Together, there are uh, modules and systems within EPIC that would allow our primary care colleagues to, to access uh, information and, and to be able to be fully informed of, of the patient's journey, both at, at St. Joe's and uh, HHS. Uh, and, and EPIC is very interested in population health, uh, and uh, we've spent some time talking to them about that. So, for example, long-term care, home care, um, 
all of these kinds of community related uh, activities can be uh, fully uh, integrated within EPIC. It's, it's a matter of not so much what EPIC can do, but what the other uh, organizations are able to, uh, to send to us uh, in order to be able to integrate that. But population health, consistency with our uh, local Hamilton health team uh, is all part of where we want to land this when it's done. And in terms of the go live, is this, um, you know, I think, how are we approaching that? Will it be rolled out unit by unit, bit by bit, or will it be all at once? I know that's a little ways down the road, but what can people expect in terms of our thinking about how we'll bring this online? So our, our plan is that this would be an enterprise-wide uh, go live. Uh, for lack of a better term, we, we, um, uh, we like to uh, call this a big bang. Uh, and it really means that at uh, 11.59, on, uh, we will be still in the Meditech world, and at 12.01, we will be an epic institution. Uh, that sounds terrifying, and uh, one of the most important uh, aspects of this is the training ahead and people's commitment to become trained, and also having people literally at the elbow uh, of clinicians uh, during those first uh, weeks to make sure that uh, people are fully supported. And once we go to this system, does that mean Meditech then is obsolete, done and gone? From a clinical point of view, Epic will go at uh, 1159 on, on the day of the, uh, of the go live. We do have back office uh, Meditech related activities uh, that will need to be uh, sorted out. But from the clinical world, uh, we will not be a Meditech shop at go live. And I think, you know, something we've discussed in the past is this is, you know, at your point, this is not an IT project. This is about transformation. So as it relates to some of the inefficiencies in our processes that we see to date, you know, how will this uh, fit with the uh, installation of Epic and the automation that can uh, occur alongside this new HIS system? You know, what will we think of from a process standpoint? How will we do that as we go to go live? So this is, this is again, to, to emphasize, probably the most important part of uh, an EPIC implementation, and that's the, the work ahead of time to, to simplify workflows, review clinical care processes, get order sets in place, uh, work with our pharmacy colleagues, and so on. All of that work to prepare for the go live is what will get us to succeed and, and to be a successful implementation uh, six months and, and forever thereafter. So all I would say is please, if you get the opportunity to contribute and you've got anything about our workflows that you think would be relevant to this, bring it to our attention and we're more than happy to, to work with everybody to make this right. And on that um, inclusive note, there's a question about the considerations in the new system about how it might be made inclusive of uh, trans and gender diverse patients. Um, what options exist then in EPIC for addressing that matter? So I, I would say two points. I think, thank you for that question. It's really important. So from the simplest uh, angle, uh, you, EPIC is working and has implemented systems where uh, individuals don't have to identify as simply male or female. Uh, gender diversity is, is important to HHS and it's been recognized very much by, by EPIC. Uh, and I, I think the other point uh, really relates to uh, our patient advisors. We will be uh, soliciting patient advisors through the process of implementation when it's relevant for patients, and I would hope that we can be uh, very inclusive as we go about identifying our patient advisors and get uh, input from, from uh, individuals who really uh, want to be heard on this issue. So I may have botched a previous question. I want to bring it back up again in light of the um, EPIC install. I think the question around clerical staff was about the, um, the on, you know, going to a new HIS system. What would be the impact there? Uh, maybe Dave, if I could call on you again to talk about um, about that matter. So I think the question is, how will the installation of Epic affect clerical staff in terms of jobs uh, and potential redeployment opportunities? Thanks, Aaron. So 
I, I think the, the word transformation gets used a lot, but that is the intent. So we are truly looking at different ways to conduct business for our patients and, uh, and our caregivers. So we would expect to see changes in how we do things at the unit level, how information transfers from, from one function to another, uh, which today may be more manual. So those opportunities uh, should come along. Uh, that means that there should be opportunities as we move through to look for ways that staff could learn new skills, redeploy elsewhere. Uh, so that will have to be a, and will be a very considered part of any kind of project like this. And it actually goes well with what Barry was just saying in terms of um, really um, looking for efficiency, looking for process change that's going to better serve ultimately our patients. So we would expect to see some, some change and uh, would work that through very transparently um, as we went through the project. Uh, the good news is uh, these projects aren't a one, good news, bad news, these projects don't take one month. It's a two year project. So we will have time to have all of that good consultation and understand uh, and manage through any changes like that. So I think that's a, a very positive outcome we're looking for. Uh, and, and from the perspective, just around a, a previous answer, the uh, clinical functions, as Barry already said, um, very much in scope, uh, not in scope of this project as the, uh, some of the more, what you might call back office functions. So the, the financial, uh, the uh, logistics, uh, et cetera, um, payables, receivables, those types of functions are not uh, captured at this point in time within the project. Um, it is not a solution that actually comes with Epic and other hospitals have done something similar where we'll maintain our existing Meditech modules that support that for uh, probably a number of years and wait for the right opportunity to transform some of those functions uh, with, uh, with something more uh, specific around that. But uh, nonetheless, I think this is the right call for us as an organization. There's only so much transformation you can do at once. And I know as we move forward, uh, we are thinking a lot about how to bring a line of sight to what other health systems have accomplished uh, using uh, this incredible transformation. So I think more to come on that. We'll be bringing that out to the organization as we get in. We now start to you know, get through the contracting phase. It's critical and then start to think about the possibilities and organize ourselves. So uh, it's wonderful news in a lot of ways uh, for HHS and our patients. And we'll hope to tell everyone a little bit more about that as we move forward. Um, I want to pivot a bit now to some uh, more, I think, operational questions about the impact of the pandemic, uh, in particular, return to work. Um, it's for those that are uh, not uh, in a clinical site and might be working from home, what's the line of sight that we have? Um, maybe, Dave, I think I can draw on you again uh, to a return to work scenario for our, our administrative areas. Uh, and do you expect to see changes to the physical environment to make that possible? Thanks, Aaron. So it's a, a very current question, of course, um, as the, the province starts to relax some of the restrictions. Uh, what does that mean for returning to work? We do uh, have formed a group that's looking at this. It's early days uh, because of a, a couple of things. Number one, uh, what does the environment need to look like? And then number two, what does that mean from a physical standpoint? Uh, there is an expectation on our part that this will take some time. This is not going to be, you know, um, I, I don't think we'll be uh, all, uh, if you're in, a, in a, you know, an administrative setting, I don't think you're gonna be back at your desk on July 2nd. It's gonna take a number of weeks to sort that through. Um, physical distancing, potentially masking. There's lots of things that we have to sort through to make it an effective environment for our staff, but also safe and adhere to the best policy guidelines that we understand from a safety standpoint. So it's, it's a bit of a more to come. We do have uh, key leaders from each of the, the more uh, administrative heavy groups uh, are involved with that work and able to give that input or feedback. So if you have any specific ideas or suggestions or concerns, make sure you float them to your manager. Um, or again, as, uh, as always, any questions can go to hhsnews at hhsc.ca and uh, we'll try to work that through. So it's going to be a bit complex uh, for sure to be able to uh, return to work. And we may not um, in the near term, you know, in the next year or so uh, feel normal. So we'll, we'll uh, provide more information as we can. Yeah, certainly shaping up to be a new normal. I already see in the chat forum, somebody suggesting for those jobs that it's appropriate that they maintain a work from home approach. Um, perhaps that's something that we'll consider. So thanks for that comment. Um, I also want to ask, what about, you know, I think we've, uh, one of the questions in the, in the chat forum is around, um, you know, vacation plans and, and sort of the next, the year ahead, recognizing that the pandemic 
uh, has changed uh, a lot for everyone. Um, what should people be thinking about as we head into 2021 in terms of making plans uh, for themselves? Um, so uh, th that's a good question, a very difficult one to answer. I think, uh, you know, in, in, and I assume it, it has to do uh, with a bit of the, the notion of travel behind that question, if it's thinking that far ahead. Uh, I, I think the best answer that can be given at this stage is uh, whatever the, the current restrictions from travel are, for example, a border crossing, et cetera, would continue to apply. Uh, so right now, um, if you were to travel internationally and make that choice, um, and we're able to do so on your own. Uh, once you return, you would require a 14-day isolation period, and that would be unpaid, as an example. So what I'm really trying to say is whatever the, the, the practices are from a government standpoint, what um, uh, uh, additional waves might look like, surges, it's very difficult to say what things might look like in 2021, um, as and when you're getting ready to make any particular vacation plans. Uh, we will, first of all, always try to keep any practices uh, update on the hub, but you could also uh, contact Employee Health uh, Safety and Wellness and, uh, and seek guidance there as to what the exact practice is at the time. Very, very difficult to predict though what travel related kind of, uh, um, you know, commitments could be made, uh, you know, going out into next calendar. Yeah, thanks for that. And one, and one of the questions in there too, just related to vacation is, and I'm not sure that this is true, but that St. Joe's is offering vacation payouts. Could HHS consider uh, something similar to that? Uh, and also the prospect of a benefits holiday uh, for those that haven't been in using benefits uh, for the last several months. Um, I'm not sure what's possible in that realm. Yeah, that's a more complex question, Aaron, uh, which we could bring back some additional information sure. on. Um, one of the things that uh, folks need to be aware of, though, even the pandemic pay uh, direction and, and legislation that uh, is coming out um, may cross impact into our ability to do other things like what was suggested in terms of could be pay out vacation. So it's not something we're certain we even could do. And, and there's lots of work that we would need to do to understand that. Uh, at the moment, um, vacation is uh, uh, something that should be managed locally with the manager. Uh, it, there's no restriction from taking vacation uh, if you know there was no direction to not take vacation uh, we'll make sure one thing that we will make sure we do is not have folks lose vacation because they weren't able to use it during this three month period but um, beyond that at this point in time it would be difficult to comment thanks very much a few more questions about the um, visitation policy uh, in our in our our practices in that regard uh, in here. So maybe I'll switch topics and go to that uh, for just a minute. In terms of uh, relaxing the visitor policy for those accompanying uh, patients to the cancer center, at the moment they're only allowed uh, for translation and cognitive issues. Uh, will that relaxation be on the horizon? Mary Kirsten, do you, do you have something you could talk to us about that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're at a starting point. Um, I think feedback like this is really helpful for us. Uh, we do need to try and kind of get a gauge of what's happening just as we've relaxed this so far. Um, so I do think, you know, we will, uh, you know, we are having daily meetings now around kind of the implications, what's kind of transpiring since we've relaxed this a bit. Um, and mindful of the other pressures, like we've added some learners, a uh, bit of research presence might be there, more patient activity. So we just don't want to make, we want to make sure that we can continue to keep everybody safe with our infection control uh, practices and so on. But I totally understand. And, you know, people won't be happy that we still have restrictions. Um, but let's, let's kind of figure out a way to move through this uh, in a way that makes sense for the organization and let us kind of get a sense of how this is going. Um, so I totally get, you know, the cancer question, there are other ones around eMERGE visits and so on. Um, I think this is, they're great questions, so I've actually written them all down and we'll bring them uh, back to our, our meetings that are going on as we check in uh, with a very large group of people from all the sites and support services to see, okay, what, what, where do we go next and uh, what would need to be true for this to continue to be successful. But the physical distancing is still really important, right? I mean, we have everybody in masks, that's key. Um, you know, we're putting on masks where we aren't able to get that physical distancing that gives us some uh, protection 
germs, uh, both as we keep our, our germs to ourselves, but also uh, perhaps have a barrier that uh, prevents that from coming to us. Um, so that's what that's all about. Um, but physical distancing will, will always still be important as much as we can do that. But we know that's uh, a practical challenge for us and why the masks are so important. But I will say in our communications with our visitors, it's really important that they follow instructions. Um, you know, there's no latitude for really to have exceptions. You know, we need people to follow the rules to keep everybody safe. And I think for the most part, people will. But please reinforce that with individuals um, that that happened. But thank you for the comments around the cancer patients and the other ones that I'm seeing. And so, so, so for someone visiting their loved one, they still need to maintain that two meter distance uh, unless they're masked or even with a mask. Again, I, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> We always we, we will always tell people to try and do that physical distancing. But you know, you have a visitor or family member coming in where they're holding hands. We don't want them right in people's faces. Again, that's not best practice. You know, that's not the safest thing to do. Um, but the practical reality is these are family members, and you know, connection and psychological and uh, physical supports are really important to that. So that that's why we have the masks. That's why we want to reinforce the hand hygiene and so on. So where we can, yes, we want that physical distancing to still be respected as much as possible. Perfect. Well, I want to move us along. I know we're coming to time. Uh, we've had a really robust Q&A today, and I know there's still some in there. As Kirsten pointed out, those are great opportunities for us to form answers uh, for initiatives that are underway as we move forward. So keep them coming. I do see uh, several in there. Uh, as always, we will provide you a direct answer or post something on the hub. Uh, there's some questions about parking and suspension of parking. I know our information on the hub is updated and available there on that topic. A rather detailed question about the OTN hub at West Lincoln. Uh, we'll make sure that we get an answer to that, as well as some questions about redeployment uh, screeners uh, and other matters. So uh, thank you for posing those. Uh, we, won't, uh, we won't lose them. Uh, and as always, thanks to those that submitted questions ahead of time. Also very helpful to keep the discussion relevant for all those that attended today. I guess uh, I want to move us now to our next section, which I think um, if I if I think maybe Dave or you're up for this one, maybe talking a bit about the special thanks and recognition week. I am. Thanks, Aaron. So absolutely. Very, very happy to speak to our special thanks and recognition week our star week. Um, you know, uh, we've just seen such incredible efforts, uh, incredible work planning and uh, navigating the impacts of COVID. Uh, we've so, seen so many practices updated, decisions made on the fly in the best interest of our patients, uh, new roles that people have adapted to, um, balancing personal and professional commitments. Folks raised their hands to volunteer to support our most vulnerable community partners in long-term care. Just so so much to be proud of and so much to acknowledge. So Star Week is our week-long celebration acknowledging the outstanding efforts of all of us, of all of our staff with online and on-site recognition for our people. Uh, we've shared some small tokens of appreciation with you, including a special lanyard pin, which I will I will put close to the camera. There's the lanyard pin, isn't that cute? So uh, we, uh, we hope that uh, you'll wear that with pride on your lanyard. Um, leaders are giving those out to all staff and physicians that are on site and will continue to uh, make sure that those that uh, are maybe not on site routinely do eventually get their pin. Uh, our residents will be coming to you via mail. Um, and uh, that includes our exceptional cohort that's about to graduate. It is uh, wonderful to know that leaders and staff are sharing cards and thanks with each other, both virtual and uh, paper. And, um, you know, we've seen so many touching nominations through a social media peer recognition contest. By the way, if you haven't gotten yours in yet, you still have to the end of the day today. And uh, I just would like us all to take a moment and, and uh, just the great team members in action. Just uh, if we have time, do we still have time for the video, Aaron? I'm not sure what time we're at. Um, I don't and, think uh, we have time for the video. We also had some technical issues. They don't always stream well on Zoom, so I think we'll forego that today, but thanks. All right, so we'll try to make sure that that's available on the Hub, which is some really great moments of team members in action. So just again, a, a huge thank you. Um, let's, let's make sure we pat ourselves and each other on the back as we continue through all the work. And uh, so much uh, thank you, by the way, to our communications team and our human resources team to help put together uh, this recognition um, effort. So uh, happy Star Week, folks. I'll turn it over to you, Aaron. Thanks. Well, maybe as we close on celebrations, Rob, I can uh, turn this over to you for closing remarks and a call for celebrations in the spirit of Star Week and always. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so um, really would encourage anybody who wants to uh, celebrate 
uh, either uh, an individual or a team uh, to uh, now is a chance to do it uh, in front of our larger uh, Hamilton Health Sciences community and maybe I'll try to kick it off just by celebrating my colleagues on the executive leadership team. You know, they've worked super hard over the past, uh, well, really since uh, the pandemic reared its head and uh, came together, worked uh, really well as a team, did a lot of innovative things um, all within HHS, but many of them are also providing important leadership um, at a regional level and at a provincial level. So anyway, really proud of the work they've done uh, and grateful for it. So I'd like to celebrate them. Thanks. Is there anyone that would like to look? I'm going to suggest a, a vocal call out. If you want to raise your hand in the participants forum, we'll turn it over to you to celebrate something that you think deserves specific remarks today before we sign off. As always, you can also type something into the um, into the forum. We'll celebrate that on the hub. And um, if you'd like me to read it out in my dulcet tone, I can do that too. So I have a shout out to Andrea Frolic and her team for the innovative resilience work that she has led. For sure, shout out to you, Andrea. A thank you to the leadership team and appreciation for the town halls. Uh, wonderful. Someone who's just put in with multiple exclamation marks, NRT. So shout out NRT. Kirsten, I see has a hand raised, so why don't we go to her? there I just want to do a shout out we have a virtual care team over at Ron Joyce who are following post-op patients uh, for about 16 weeks uh, they've so they're kind of midway through um, so uh, we have a number of I think about 18 uh, staff over there providing 24 7 coverage um, so it's a nice experiment um, during this period of time so thanks to that group and the leadership of uh, Jen Lounsbury and Michael McGillian uh, from the university who've also put a great infrastructure around this uh, to evaluate and Ted Scott uh, from the research group who's been so supportive of this. So thank you. Additional shout outs, some emphatic shout outs to our screeners as well as our occupational health nurses, two for occupational health. Susan's team rocks. And now maybe we go to A. Jolie uh, for a shout out, a live shout out, please. So over to you. Are you there? We don't want to miss your shout out. Probably needs to unmute then. Oh no, technical difficulties. Well, you could put your, maybe you could type it into the, um, excuse me, into the chat forum. Okay. So lots of shout outs today. There's still some mounting in the chat forum. I want to be respectful of time. Uh, we're two minutes over, so maybe we'll sign off today. Uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, any closing remarks from you, Rob? Uh, just thanks to all for uh, attending today. Um, really appreciate people taking a bit of time. Uh, like the forthrightness of the questions and great to see all those shout outs. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. The weather's getting a little nicer, so hopefully you'll um, get some uh, time to spend with uh, loved ones, uh, you know, within your bubble. Um, and uh, wish everybody uh, well until uh, we do another one of these. So thanks, Aaron.